We've colored three regions in the diagram. We have a yellow, blue, and green region, and our first goal is to try to figure out where we're going to be able to place Q3 so that the net force on all of the charges is zero. For a moment, let's assume we place Q3 right here, and let's further assume that it is positively charged. Now, if that were the case, then Q1 would repel Q3 to the left, and Q2 would also repel Q3 to the left, because like charges repel. But that can't work because then the net force acting on Q3 would not be equal to zero newtons. And the question requires the net force on all of the charges to be zero. So it can't be placed in the yellow region if it were a positive charge. Same thing is true if it were a negative charge, because in that case, Q1 would attract Q3 to the right, and Q2 would also attract Q3 to the right. Same problem, the net force would not equal zero. So it can't be in the yellow region, by a similar line of reasoning, it won't be in the green region. You might want to try that out for yourself. So we can conclude pretty confidently here that Q3 must be located between the two charges. Now, for a moment, let us place Q3 right here. Let's try to next figure out whether it's positive or negative. If Q3 were positive, that would make all three charges positive. But then all three charges would simply repel away from one another. So for example, Q1 would be pushed to the left by Q3. Q1 would also be pushed to the left by Q2. You have that same scenario where the net force acting on a charge would not equal zero. So the assumption that Q3 is positive is an erroneous assumption. Let's make Q3 negative, and that's going to turn out to work. Now, how do we know that? Well, if Q3 were negative, then there would be a force from Q1 pulling Q3 to the left. We might want to call that F13. And then we would also have an attractive force between Q2 and Q3 because they're opposite in sign. So we have this attractive force here. That would be acting between charges 2 and 3. So this can work because those forces would cancel out and that would make a net force on Q3 equal to zero. Now, let us call this distance from the origin to Q3 x. Then hopefully we can see from the diagram that this distance from Q3 to Q2 would be L minus x. And we now know from our analysis that the force acting between charges one and three is going to equal the magnitude of the force between charges two and three. Let's start to fill in those forces using Coulomb's law. We know that Coulomb's law states the force acting between two charges is equal to the Coulomb's constant multiplied by the magnitude of the charge of one object times the magnitude of charge on the other object divided by the distance between them squared. So for example, for the force acting between charges one and three, we would have K multiplied by the magnitude of charge one, multiplied by the magnitude of charge three, and then divide by the distance between them squared. Now, the distance between charges one and three, we can see from the diagram is X. So we're gonna have X squared here. Now we go over and set this equal to the force acting between charges two and three. Same kind of idea, we have the Coulomb's constant multiplied by the magnitude of charge on particle two, multiplied by the magnitude of charge on particle three, and then divided by the distance between them squared. Look at the diagram and you can see that the distance between charges two and three was the L minus X. Don't forget to square that. Now we can simplify this equation a little bit. We can cancel out the Ks. Basically you would be dividing K on both sides. We can do the same thing with Q3. So now we're left with a simpler equation. We have the magnitude of charge one over X squared is equal to the magnitude of charge two divided by L minus X squared. We can begin to fill in some numbers. We do know that the charge Q1 was equal to positive Q. Indeed, that was correct. So for Q1, you can fill in positive Q. Notice we don't need the absolute values anymore because it's a positive anyways over x squared equals, now q2 was the charge on particle two, we can see that that was equal to positive four q, and then divided by l minus x squared. Now we actually know l as well, so we might wanna fill that in, that was nine centimeters. So we actually have nine centimeters minus x. Don't forget to square it. Now, if we divide q on both sides, we would actually be able to cancel them out. Don't forget to leave a one right here. So now we have a very simple equation, one over x squared is equal to four over 
9 minus x squared. One trick for solving this equation is to take the square root on both sides. Just make sure you square root the numerator and denominator. So for example, the square root of 1 is 1. The square root of x squared is x. The square root of 4 is 2. And then the square root of the quantity 9 minus x squared is just 9 minus x. And now we can just do a little cross multiplication. So if we multiply this way, we have 9 minus x times 1, which is 9 minus x. We multiply or cross multiply that way, we get 2x. Add x to both sides and then divide by 3. And we can see that x was equal to 3. Let's remember that this was in centimeters. So let's see if this helps us answer any parts of this question here. Part A wanted the x coordinate of particle 3. Well, we just figured out that that distance x was 3 centimeters. So in fact, the correct answer for part A would be x is equal to 3 centimeters. For the y coordinate, which is what they want in part B, we can see that charge Q3 is sitting on the x axis. So the y coordinate would simply be 0 centimeters. So now we need to look at part C. They want the ratio of Q3 to Q. And to answer that, let's actually take a look at the charge marked Q, the one that's at the origin. And what we want to do is look at the forces that are acting on that particular charge. So we want to clean up this diagram just a little bit. And again, we're looking at the forces acting on the charge located at the origin. Now, one force is an attractive force, right? We have Q3, which is negative, pulling Q1 to the right. So we might call that force F13. But at the same time, we have particle 2, which is positive, repelling the charge at the origin, which is also positive. So we have a repulsive force going that way, and that would be perhaps indicated by F12. Now, once again, we know that these two forces have to be equal in magnitude because all three charges are remaining at rest. There's no acceleration here. So what we're going to kind of do here is set F12 equal to F13. This will look very similar to what we've already done. So for F12, we would have K multiplied by the charge on particle 1, multiplied by the charge on particle 2, divided by the distance between them squared. Now look at particle 1 and particle 2, and you can see that the distance between them is L. So it'll be over L squared. And then we'll set this equal to the, uh, the force between charges 1 and 3. So that would be K times Q1 and Q3, divided by the distance between those squared. Now that distance between Q1 and Q3 was just X. So this will be X squared. We can adjust this equation because we know q1 was equal to q, q2 was equal to 4q, and then divide by l squared. The other side we have k, again q1 was equal to q, and then q3, we don't have that particular value, so we're just going to leave that as q3, and then divide by x squared. Now we can simplify in the same kind of way as we did before, these k's will cancel out these q's should cancel out or will cancel out as well. So now we can rewrite the equation again. We have 4q over l squared is equal to q3 over x squared. We want the ratio q3 over q. So we have to do a little bit of algebraic manipulation here. Why don't we first multiply both sides of the equation by x squared? So now we have 4x squared q over L squared is equal to Q3, because these X squareds will cancel out. And then finally, multiply both sides by 1 over Q. So then these Qs cancel. So now we have 4X squared whoopsies, over L squared is equal to this ratio Q3 over Q. Now be a little careful here. Remember, Q was a positive charge, as indicated in the question. Q3, we had concluded earlier, was a negative charge. So in fact, even though the algebra didn't quite dictate, we have a negative divided by a positive. That means that this ratio necessarily will come out negative. So you're actually going to have negative 4x squared over L squared. Be very careful about that. And now all we have to do is fill in the given information. We're kind of zigzagging here. But to cap this off, Q3 over Q is equal to negative 4 times x. Now x we discovered was 3 
Don't forget to square it and then divide it by L, which was 9. Don't forget to square that as well. So when you work this out, as we shall do on our calculators here, you are going to end up with negative 0.444. So that would be the correct answer for the ratio of Q3 to Q.